Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. University and education to me is, is huge. It's all about all and it's all about diversity. And equally, I think it's inspiring other folk. And if you do that, then you get great rewards yourself. And one of the things I hope for in the, the Chancellor's Talk series is that Edinburgh Napier University extend a welcome to all. It shouldn't just be about our staff and students. It should be about people who want to learn and possibly we can offer something to a world that they may not otherwise experience. So you guys, when you leave here tonight, and there will be another Chancellor's Talk series after that, please feel free to bring people along who have a genuine interest. That the only criteria is that they have an open mind, they accept diversity, and they wish to learn. That, that's the, the crux of it all. Anyway, before I rabble, uh, it goes on about my success. I, my success is measured by standing here with you guys before me tonight, so this is all irrelevant. Uh, the talk series. We launched it in March 2016 uh, with a chap called Milton Glazer. Now, many folk in this room will have never heard of Milton Glazer, but probably everyone will be aware of some of the contributions Milton's made to the world of graphic design and modern culture. Milton, uh, if any Bob Dylan fans were here, was the guy responsible for all your psychedelic uh, Bob Dylan covers. He also, as this is more an American thing, he was the creator of the, the iconic uh, Brooklyn Lager change. But most people will know Milton for I Heart NY. He created the greatest marketing logo in the world. Uh, and on that point, I would like to add, this was when New York was on its knees in 1977. He scribbled it in the back of a taxi and he donated it to the city. So we launched it with Milton. We followed that by a, a, a friend of mine, a chap called Jeremy Thomas, who is a film producer and probably Britain's most successful independent film producer. Jeremy won an Oscar at 38 for producing Bertolucci's movie, The Last Emperor. He also produced uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, Naked Lunch, uh, Rabbit Proof Fence, Sexy Beast, Young Adam, uh, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. The list goes on and on and on. And finally, the third person in the, the, the series uh, before tonight's guest was just an amazing lady, a lady called Anne Daniels, who at one point was demented. She didn't know what to do. She had no outdoor experience. She was a single mother of triplets, 18 months. I was going to say all 18 months, but that would make sense. 18-month-old uh, triplets and with no outdoor experience. And nine months later, she was on a polar expedition. Anne and her, her polar partner, uh, if there is such a phrase, became the first female duo to do both the North and South Pole. And Anne came and just, she just gave a normality to an incredible journey and offered us some insight into what keeps you going. Anyway, tonight is the fourth in the series and I'm delighted to welcome the Right Honourable James Wolfe QC, who was appointed Lord Advocate last year. James became an advocate in 1992 and was the first standing junior counsel to the Scottish ministers from 2002 to 2007. The same year he was appointed Queen's Counsel. From 2007 to 2010, he served as an advocate deputy. Called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2013, James was elected Dean of the Faculty of Advocates in 2014 and was appointed as Lord Advocate on the 1st of June 2016. The Lord Advocate is the Senior Law Officer of the Scottish Government and is the head of the system of prosecution and investigation of deaths in Scotland. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you to put your hands together and welcome the Lord Advocate, the Right Honourable James Will QC. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, very much for those words, and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak to you tonight. Um, it's slightly unnerving to be speaking under a very large picture of myself. Um, it gives me the opportunity to talk about some things that I believe to be uh, important, things which one way or another I've worried away at uh, in the course of my career, and also to speak about some things which have 
uh, real practical importance for me in the work that I currently do, particularly as head of the system of prosecution uh, in Scotland. Um, it's timely that I should be speaking as head of the system of prosecution in Scotland to you this week. Um, last Saturday was the 25th of November, um, which since 1999 has been marked as the United Nations Day for the Elimination of Violence uh, Against Women. Uh, it was also the first day of the annual 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. Uh, so we are, if my arithmetic is correct, on day five. Uh, and those 16 days of activism run through to International Human Rights Day on the 10th of December. Napier University uh, is actively supporting and contributing to the 16 days of activism. And this lecture accordingly gives me an opportunity both to uh, thank and congratulate the university on its support for that campaign. Uh, but also an opportunity during the 16 days of activism to say publicly that tackling gender-based violence is an issue for every one of us. Uh, it's particularly an issue for men. It is, after all, about the behavior of men, some men, towards women and girls. The title of my lecture is Law, Democracy, and Fundamental Rights, and I, I want to say something of a rather general nature about these three pillars of a modern constitutional democracy. Uh, but these things matter, uh, not in the abstract, but because of their practical implications. Experience suggests that democratic societies which respect the rule of law and which protect fundamental rights tend to be societies in which individuals and communities uh, thrive and in which people can live better lives. Um, so I'm going to make some general observations about um, the, those three pillars of constitutional democracy. Uh, and then um, I, I want to talk about making fundamental rights a reality uh, and to use uh, the timing of this lecture during the 16 days of activism to reflect on some of the work that we're doing to tackle gender-based violence as an example of how um, we seek to make real the protection of, of fundamental rights. Um, because if there's a key point that I want to, to make, it's that a well-functioning rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights don't just happen by accident or without effort. They depend on practical, concrete steps, the establishment and maintenance of institutions through which the law can be enforced and rights protected, reform of those institutions when they require reform so that they can better fulfill those essential functions, the pro promotion of a culture which supports those values, and day in uh, and day out, the administration of the law in individual cases. Uh, it's these things that make fundamental rights uh, a reality. Uh, and I also want to make the point that supporting the rule of law and advancing the protection of fundamental rights is not just a job for the courts and those who work in the courts, albeit that the courts are the guardians and guarantors of the rule of law, but it's also a job for the democratic parts of the Constitution, for governments and parliaments, and indeed for all of us who uh, care about uh, the society in which we, we live. Before I speak to the topic, perhaps I ought to say something about um, how they relate to my responsibilities as, as Lord Advocate. Um, there have been Lord Advocates since at least the 15th century. Um, in 1587, uh, the Lord Advocate was given the title to prosecute all criminal offences in the public interest. And it is still the case today that all serious criminal cases in Scotland, all criminal cases heard before a jury, are prosecuted in my name as Lord Advocate. Before devolution, the Lord Advocate was a minister in the United Kingdom government responsible for advising the UK government on matters of Scots law. 
although in earlier times the functions of the Lord Advocate were very much more extensive. Um, if you go to St. Andrew's Square, on top of the pillar in the center of St. Andrew's Square is a statue of Henry Dundas, who was a late 18th century uh, Lord Advocate, um, who as Lord Advocate effectively uh, governed uh, Scotland. Uh, these days, Lord Advocates are not put on pedestals. Um, today, the Lord Advocate is the senior law officer in the Scottish Government. Um, uh, uh, the first section of the Scottish Ministerial Code commits the government to complying with the law, including international law and treaty obligations, and to upholding the administration of justice. And the Code states that it is part of the role of the law officers and that's the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General for Scotland who assists me in my responsibilities to ensure that the government acts lawfully at all times. Uh, so as Lord Advocate, I'm responsible for the legal advice which is tendered to government and also for the skilled lawyers who draft acts of the Scottish Parliament. And I have some particular constitutional responsibilities under the Scotland Act in relation to uh, acts of, of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, in addition to those governmental functions, the Lord Advocate is, as David observed, the head of the systems of prosecution and investigation of deaths in Scotland. And I'm accordingly responsible, the minister who is responsible for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, the public prosecution service in Scotland. Uh, I exercise those functions entirely independently of any other person. Uh, in a recent case which uh, arose from the uh, uh, tragic um, bin lorry uh, case in Glasgow, the Criminal Appeal Court uh, stated that it is important in the public interest that prosecutors exercise their judgment independently, robustly, forensically and objectively. Uh, and the point's this, that regardless of the public attention which a criminal case may excite in the media or elsewhere, prosecutors must not be influenced by extraneous considerations. They have to make decisions like judges uh, objectively and professionally on the basis of the evidence uh, available to them. And it's my responsibility as Lord Advocate to promote and defend the integrity and independence of the professional prosecutors who deal with allegations of criminality day in and day out uh, across Scotland. So I have quite a wide suite of responsibilities which are related in one way or another to the rule of law and to the fair administration of justice in Scotland. The Parliamentary Council who draft legislation and for whose work I'm responsible, helped by their skill in drafting to make the law clear. Through my responsibilities as the government's senior law officer, I seek to promote that important feature of the rule of law that the government should respect and act in accordance with the law and the sound administration of justice. And as head of the system of prosecution and investigation of deaths, I have overall responsibility for the enforcement of the uh, criminal law. And I come to those responsibilities as a professional lawyer uh, without any party political affiliation. I've spent almost all of my career as a professional advocate in practice at the Scottish Bar. I've prosecuted serious crime in the High Court, murders, serious drug cases, uh, rapes. I've argued constitutional and commercial cases um, up and down the court system. And I've represented all sorts of clients from large corporations to uh, asylum seekers. Uh, some of you may have noticed I got involved in uh, the case in the Supreme Court last year about the Article 50 notice. Uh, and I also argued the recent Supreme Court uh, uh, case involving minimum unit pricing for the Scottish Government. I qualified as an advocate in 1992 and I've accordingly practiced law at a time of extraordinary constitutional uh, change. We've seen the establishment of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and we've seen a revolution in the protection of fundamental rights in our legal system through the enactment of the Human Rights Act in 1998 the Scotland Act 1998 and the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And through the enactment of those uh, 
instruments, it's become possible for people to enforce these fundamental rights uh, in our own courts. And some of those cases have had very significant uh, consequences. If I think about cases in which I've been involved personally, on one side or the other, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, um, it was a case brought up by a prisoner in Barlini against the Scottish ministers, which led to the end of the practice of slopping out in Scottish prisons. Uh, another case uh, in which I represented the ministers led to the provision of legal assistance for parents uh, at children's hearings. Uh, in, a, in the famous case of Cadder against the Lord Advocate, the Supreme Court held that the practice of relying at a trial on a police interview with a suspect who had not been given access to legal advice was not compatible with the right to a fair trial and the law was swiftly changed uh, to facilitate the provision of uh, legal advice to people who are suspected of crime. In another case, I represented a refugee who was accused of immigration offences and that case led to a change in Crown Office policy to recognise that to prosecute refugees for certain types of offence would not be compatible with the International Refugee Convention, which commits us as a country to the protection of refugees. And in another case involving, I suppose involving indirectly, um, uh, refugees. Uh, I represented the wife of a refugee who was uh, seeking indefinite leave to remain in the UK um, after she had separated from her husband. Um, she relied on a, a rule which allows the spouse of a British citizen uh, to stay in the United Kingdom if they've separated in circumstances of domestic violence, the idea being that um, you shouldn't be put to uh, uh, stay in an abusive relationship uh, in order to avoid deportation. Um, the rule did not apply to her because her husband was a refugee, but the court held that that was a breach of her right to equal treatment and non-discrimination. Um, and I mention those cases because they illustrate a number of things. First of all, they, in, they illustrate that the protection of fundamental rights uh, through the courts can make a real difference to ordinary people. The woman who would be entitled to receive legal help in a children's hearing, uh, which was liable to fundamentally affect her relationship with her children. Uh, the wife of the refugee who was forced, not forced to stay in an abusive relationship for fear of being uh, deported. Uh, but they also illustrate how giving effect to fundamental rights may depend ultimately on action taken by government uh, and parliament. Improving prison conditions may have been prompted by a case brought by Mr. Napier, but it depended ultimately on investment in the prison uh, estate. And providing legal assistance for parents involved in children's hearings may have been prompted by a particular case, but it required the establishment of a scheme of legal assistance applicable to children's hearings. Uh, and these cases also, of course, illustrate the role that the courts have in deciding disputes between citizens and the state, uh, and indeed between citizens and citizens. Um, it's the hallmark of a society governed by the rule of law that people's rights and obligations are decided according to laws which are set out in advance and which are decided by independent courts according to a fair procedure. Uh, writers about the rule of law emphasize the importance of those structures in protecting us from arbitrary action by the state. I did not follow the instructions. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep, I think that stopped. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I want to just speak for just a moment on the um, you know, why it is that these uh, sort of fairly basic um, structures, um, which we tend to describe as um, in a sort of simple shorthand way as the rule of law, why they, why they matter. Um, and writers on the rule of law usually start by saying they matter because they protect us from arbitrary action by the state. Um, uh, the late Lord Bingham 
who was the first president of the UK Supreme Court, a, a very great modern judge, observed that the hallmarks of a regime which flouts the rule of law are, alas, all too familiar. The midnight knock on the door, the sudden disappearance, the show trial, the subjection of prisoners to genetic experiment, the confession extracted by torture, the gulag and the concentration camp, the gas chamber, the practice of genocide or ethnic cleansing, the waging of aggressive war. Uh, and indeed, the, the 25th of November was identified as the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, because on that date, uh, in 1960, three sisters from the Dominican Republic, who opposed the dictatorship which then governed that country, were assassinated on his orders. Um, uh, thankfully, we live in a society which respects the rule of law and where these implications of respect for the rule of law are remote from our own circumstances. Uh, although, as the son of a refugee from Hitler's Germany, I believe strongly that we must not forget uh, them uh, as part of the background to the institutions uh, about which I'm speaking. But there are, in fact, much more mundane and routine, but no less important ways in which the rule of law contributes to a well-functioning and just society. It establishes a framework within which people can live their lives with a degree of confidence that the law will protect them. The criminal law sets out the basic demands which society makes on all of us, not to kill, not to assault, not to steal, not to defraud, and so on. And the effective, rigorous, and fair prosecution of crime in the public interest helps to keep people and communities safe from crime, uh, disorder, and danger. Uh, you see every day in the newspapers accounts of cases in which offenders have been brought to justice through the criminal courts. Uh, and every one of those cases is a vindication of the effective enforcement uh, of the law. And the criminal law, of course, also protects the interests of society in cases where there may be no individual victim. For example, when we enforce environmental regulations which are designed to protect the uh, environment, or where we take uh, uh, criminal proceedings uh, against uh, individuals who undermine the regime which is intended to protect fish stocks, and so on and so forth. And moving from the criminal law to the civil law, the law which concerns contracts and property and so on, uh, that law too provides a framework within which people can plan their affairs with a degree of confidence that their reasonable expectations will be fulfilled. If in our system you buy a house, you can be confident that your title as owner of the house will be recognized and that your rights as owner will be respected and protected. And safe in that knowledge, you can spend money improving your property, confident that you will obtain the benefit of that investment. We take these things for granted, but not all societies uh, can. The law also prescribes the rules which regulate the economic market. Uh, Adam Smith wrote of the importance to economic success of the sound administration of justice. The rules need to be enforced. So when we prosecute fraud and other crimes committed in a business context, and when we consistently enforce the various regulations which govern or affect market behavior, we help to secure the integrity of the economic system. And it's for just these sorts of reasons that a former president of the World Bank, Robert Zellick, observed the most fundamental prerequisite for sustainable development is an effective rule of law. And although this may be most obvious in developing economies where the rule of law is weak, it is in fact no less true in a developed economy such as our own with a long and strong tradition of respect uh, for the law. Uh, in effect, the law is part of the infrastructure of a well-functioning society. And just like the physical infrastructure of society, if the law and its institutions are in disrepair, that can impede both social uh, and economic uh, well-being. Uh, there is furthermore a deep connection between the rule of law and democracy. It's the democratically accountable institutions of the state, government and legislatures, which are the engines of social progress and change. And the law is one of the instruments through which those democratically accountable institutions effect change. And the enforcement of those laws 
uh, is a reflection not just of our commitment to the rule of law itself, but to the democratic uh, process and the democratic institutions which made, uh, made those laws. Uh, earlier this year, the UK Supreme Court heard a case in which Unison argued that the fees imposed in employment tribunals were unlawful because they impeded access uh, to justice. Lord Reid, one of the Scottish judges on the Supreme Court, gave an explanation of these constitutional fundamentals. Um, it's so good that I'm going to read you uh, a passage from the case. Uh, and it's perhaps um, uh, worth noting that the court decided that the fees that were being charged for employment tribunal proceedings were unlawful because they impeded access uh, unduly uh, to justice before the tribunals. Uh, and Lord Reed said this, at the heart of the concept of the rule of law is the idea that society is governed by law. Parliament exists primarily in order to make laws for society in this country. Democratic procedures exist primarily in order to ensure that the parliament which makes those laws include members who are chosen by the people of this country and are accountable to them. Courts exist to ensure that the laws made by parliament and the common law created by the courts themselves are applied and enforced. That role includes ensuring that the executive branch of government carries out its functions in accordance with the law. In order for the courts to perform that role, people must in principle have unimpeded access to them. Without such access, laws are liable to become a dead letter. The work done by Parliament may be rendered nugatory, and the democratic election of members of Parliament may become a meaningless charade. That is why the courts do not merely provide a uh, public, public service uh, like uh, any other. And he went on to speak about the decisions that the courts make in cases that have a general significance. Uh, and also to point out that people in businesses need to know that they will be able to enforce their rights if they have to do so. And on the other hand, that if they fail to meet their obligations, there's likely to be a remedy against them. Uh, and he said, it is that knowledge which underpins everyday economic and social transactions. That role of the courts is not always as well understood as it uh, might be. Uh, you'll recall the headline, Enemies of the People, after the decision in the divisional court in the Brexit case last year. What was objectionable about that headline was not that it criticized a, a, a decision of the courts, uh, but that it criticized personally the judges involved as individuals for doing the job uh, which they are tasked to perform. Uh, judges, after all, cannot answer back, and their job of adjudicating fairly and with integrity according to the law is, for the reasons that Lord Reed explained, one of the fundamentals of a constitutional democracy. Let me turn then to say something about the protection of fundamental rights. I mentioned earlier that the 10th of December is International Human Rights Day. Uh, that day marks the anniversary each year of the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was a response in the aftermath of the Second World War to the perpetration before and during that war of gross breaches of human rights. The Declaration sets out both civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. And the preamble to the Declaration states that the rights within it are based on the proposition that recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace uh, in the world. And on the back of the Universal Declaration, a body of international human rights law has uh, developed. Uh, we have, I believe, a lot to be proud of in relation to the protection of fundamental rights in our law. As long ago as 1587, the Scottish Parliament gave accused persons the right to be represented by counsel. Uh, this was some 150 years before it became normal 
in criminal trials in England and Wales to allow legal representation. So we can and should look to our own law uh, as th the primary basis for protecting fundamental rights uh, in Scotland. But without an explicit commitment to the protection of fundamental rights and the opportunity where necessary to test ourselves against international standards, as we can under the Human Rights Act, there is a risk that we may lose sight of the imperatives which flow from that inherent dignity of all human beings, which is referred to in the preamble to the Universal Declaration. The effective protection of fundamental rights depends on, perhaps rather obviously, on the existence of rules and institutions which uh, give effect to them. It's perhaps rather a basic point, but there's no point in having a right to a fair trial unless the state establishes a court system staffed by independent and impartial judges. And the effective advancement of economic rights, um, the right to health care, um, and so on, plainly depend on positive state action. Uh, and although the European Convention on Human Rights is concerned primarily with civil and political rights, the European Court of Human Rights has recognized that some of those rights impose positive obligations on the state. So, for example, in relation to the right to life, the European Court has said that, that the state has a primary duty to secure the right to life by putting in place effective criminal law provisions to deter the commission of offences against the person, backed up by law enforcement machinery for the prevention, suppression, and sanctioning of breaches of such provisions. And I suppose as head of the system of prosecution in Scotland, I look uh, particularly at the part of that um, positive duty which talks about the requirement to back up criminal law with effective uh, law enforcement uh, machinery. That obligation applies not only to the right to life, but the right not to be subjected to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment, the right not to be enslaved, uh, and from that flow a set, set of obligations in relation to human trafficking, uh, and also aspects of the right to privacy. So what I now want to do, that's uh, against the background of recognizing those positive obligations um, in certain areas to put in place effective criminal law provisions backed up by law enforcement machinery. I want to turn back to um, the 16 days of activism. Uh, for if we take seriously the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family, we cannot ignore uh, gender-based violence. Uh, the protection from gender-based violence is a, a, a human rights issue uh, acknowledged in the Istanbul Convention, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. And Article 5 of that convention states that parties shall take the necessary legislative and other measures to exercise due diligence to prevent, investigate, punish and provide reparation for acts of violence covered by the scope of the convention. Uh, and although the UK um, uh, ha hasn't quite yet ratified that convention, uh, the UK has signed it and, its, and ratification uh, is expected. And in any event, the positive obligations of the state under the European Convention on Human Rights uh, have been invoked and applied uh, in relation to the prosecution of gender based violence. Uh, so let me um, uh, speak a little about the, uh, the ways in which uh, we are uh, uh, tackling gender-based violence. Um, if I put this in context, uh, serious sexual offences now make up 75% of the cases which we prosecute in the High Court in Scotland. And while the number of non-sexual uh, uh, violent crimes um, has, has fallen markedly uh, over the last 10 years, by contrast, we see a significant increase in the reporting of serious sexual crimes. Now, that means that victims of serious sexual crimes are coming forward. 
that cases are being prosecuted and perpetrators brought to justice. Uh, no one should doubt the seriousness of purpose which as prosecutors we apply and will apply to these cases which are among the most serious which we prosecute. The victims of sexual offences include men and women and every one of those cases uh, 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 will be treated with equal seriousness. But the reality is that these crimes disproportionately affect women. Where identifiable, 94% of the crimes of rape and attempted rape and 87% of the crimes of sexual assault in 2015 to 16 had a female victim. Uh, we have in place a modern legislative framework for addressing offences of this sort. The Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 restated the law placing consent at the heart of the law. And it's the statute under which we prosecute rape, sexual assault, sexual co coercion, and a range of uh, offences against children uh, and others. Um, and there are other legislative provisions which we have available, notably provisions in the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act of 2010, which address threatening and abusive behaviour and stalking. And these offences were supplemented in July 2017, when the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act came into effect, creating a specific offence of sharing private, intimate images uh, without consent. Uh, and since then, we've, we've uh, prosecuted successfully uh, a number of cases under uh, that act. As prosecutors, we recognise that the particular features of sexual offences demands a specialist response. In 2009, the Crown established the National Sex Crimes Unit, one of the first of its kind. Uh, it's a cohort of specialist Crown counsel, the most senior prosecutors in our system, who specialise in dealing with these cases. And the service has responded to the increase in reports of serious sexual crime by establishing specialist teams of prosecutors in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen and Dundee. The evidence of the victim is at the heart of cases involving sexual offending. Unless victims of these crimes, which are among the most serious which we prosecute, are willing to come forward and to give evidence, we cannot prosecute the perpetrators of sexual violence and sexual crime. And if we cannot prosecute the perpetrators of those crimes, then we cannot fulfill our public responsibility to provide effective protection to the victims, including children and vulnerable adults who've been the victims of abuse and women and children who've been the victims of sexual violence. And that's why as prosecutors, uh, we engage with victims of crime. We seek to give them the confidence to come forward and to speak up uh, so that we can, so far as we are, 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 are able to, support and enable them through the criminal justice process. And it's why, as prosecutors, we're interested in promoting change where that's necessary and appropriate so that the criminal justice process allows their evidence to be heard. We recognise that giving evidence in these cases requires the victim to speak publicly about deeply personal matters and to be questioned. Deep-seated inhibitions and, indeed, the consequences of the crimes perpetrated against them may inhibit victims of sexual crimes from coming forward and may make it difficult for them to give evidence effectively or at all. We know that the criminal justice process can be challenging for many victims of crime and particularly the victims of sexual crime and the vulnerable who are most at risk and who find it most difficult to give evidence are the very people who most require the protection of the law. That is why the arrangements for giving evidence now include special arrangements for children and vulnerable witnesses. It's why we treat all victims of sexual offences as vulnerable for those purposes. The measures may include, for example, the use of screens in court so the victim doesn't have to see the accused and the facility to give evidence from a remote location uh, by video link. The prosecution service was in the lead in Scotland in recognising the needs of victims of crime. Its victim support staff provide information to victims, communicate with, with them with a view to facilitating and securing appropriate measures at court, and signpost them to other services. Uh, and work is in hand to improve this aspect of the prosecution service's work. Earlier this year, a new victim strategy uh, was uh, implemented. But there is more which can and should be done 
and the service is working with rape crisis and others with a view to learning from the victim's experience of the justice system. But the needs of victims of crime, particularly the victims of sexual offences, often go well beyond the particular professional focus which prosecutors must, by reason of their public responsibilities, maintain. Last year, a review of the services available to victims by the former Solicitor General, Dr. Leslie Thompson, identified the need for a more holistic approach across the whole system to the provision of support for victims. As prosecutors, we recognise the value to victims of effective support, and I accordingly welcome the funding which the Scottish Government makes available for support and advocacy services for the victims of sexual offences. Attending to the needs uh, and interests of victims of crime does not undermine our fundamental commitment to a fair trial. That commitment is axiomatic, uh, nor does it undermine our commitment as prosecutors to acting independently in the public interest. That too is axiomatic. But if we're serious about protecting the vulnerable and tackling sexual offending, we're challenged to consider reforms to our system which continue to secure the accused's right to a fair trial while seeking to reduce the traumatic effect which the justice process can have on the victims of crime. The criminal justice system has an essential play, part to play in tackling gender-based violence, but it is just one part of society's uh, response. Uh, five days ago, the Scottish Government published its equally safe delivery plan updating its strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls with a focus on prevention. Uh, the very range of actions set out in that delivery plan illustrate the point that advancing the protection of fundamental rights in this field uh, involve actions which are just not, about, not just about what happens in court cases. A criminal prosecution will always happen after the event but is about actions which can be taken to prevent, uh, prevent violations of rights taking place in the first place. So if I draw together some uh, concluding uh, remarks, um, when one thinks about the, the rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights, it's easy to talk uh, in the abstract. Uh, the high constitutional principles which those phrases reflect are important, and, and, and I believe it is important to reflect sometimes on the ways in which they underpin and support the good society in which we all aspire to live. But they matter ultimately because of the practical effect which they make on the ground to people's lives. And that's why we should be interested in practical steps which make a real difference in changes in the law, such as the domestic abuse bill which is going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment, and changes uh, in practice such as the changes in the way in which we support uh, victims of crime and enable them to give evidence uh, effectively. Uh, our commitment to the rule of law mustn't be a commitment simply to the rules of law and the practices with which we happen to be familiar, but to the rule of law as a fundamental principle of a good society. And it should be a commitment not only to the ideals which animate our constitution, but to practical actions which make those ideals uh, a reality. Uh, thank you very much.